Hi, this is Jeff Knopp, and welcome to the Writing Idiomatic Python video series. Uh, this is the second video in the series, and we're going to be looking at a script that acts as an HTTP proxy, uh, and seeing if we can't refactor it and make it um, a bit nicer, a bit more Pythonic, using the principles from my book, Writing Idiomatic Python. Um, so, as I said, the script is a proxy, and let's start out by just seeing what I have in this workspace directory. Uh, these files are exactly the same, so both represent the original code for the proxy. Uh, proxy orig we will keep as it was, um, and we'll be working on the proxy.py file, so we can, you know, see changes between them when we're done. Um, so I'm going to fire up vim um, and load the proxy.py file. Uh, now you'll see, uh, and hopefully you actually will see, because a lot of people uh, had some problems being able to see the screen last time. So I've made sure that uh, the fonts and everything are much larger, and hopefully you'll be able to see this much easier. Um, so anyway, you'll see that there's a lot of um, front matter that, uh, with documentation, licensing. Um, so uh, having read that and you know understanding that what we're doing here is fine, I'm just going to delete this, especially because most of the documentation is uh, in Portuguese. OK, so now we get to the actual code. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do, when I save this, I have my Vim set up, uh, as I mentioned in the first video, to automatically run uh, tools like PyLint and PEP8 on the, the file each time I save. So as soon as I save this, uh, we're going to see little red arrows appear to the left of the line numbers, um, and those represent violations of one of those scripts. So one of the first things I, I do when refactoring is just save a file so I can see you know, what are the most obvious things that should be changed. Uh, so let's go ahead and save the file. And now you can see here this new um, bar ha column has popped up uh, with all these reported errors. Uh, and in line, you'll see where the errors are. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in the beginning, the first thing to do is just to get to a point where there aren't any more of these violations of like PEP8 or just you know reasonable Python programming. Um, so let's go through the script real quick and do that. Um, if I go to if I put my cursor on a line down here, I can see what the violation actually is. So this one is complaining about multiple imports on one line. And some of you may be thinking, well, I do that. Why is that an issue? Um, it's just a lot easier uh, for a reader to determine what you're importing uh, if you import everything, uh, just one thing per line. So. A lot of people will have um, uh, multiple different packages imported on one line, and they'll do that five or six times. So it looks like they're saving space, but really all they're doing is confusing the reader, because the reader now can't just scan right down the list. The reader has to read across and see everything that's actually being uh, imported. And most of the time, the packages don't have anything to do with one another, so there's no reason to group them together. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I like to do is um, kind of label sets of imports. So I break them into three different groups. Um, standard library imports, which these three all are. Uh, Third-party packages, which I'm using. And then what I call application imports, uh, which are imports of packages that I wrote or that are part of the project that we're working on. So I'll just put a little comment here, application. Oops, I'm sorry. Now they are uh, standard library imports. Uh, I can't spell today. 
Okay, and we also need a doc string. So let's just describe what this actually does. Uh, an HTTP proxy supports IPv6 as well as the HTTP connect method. among other things. Um, and so those are the two, you know, a proxy is a proxy at the end of the day, but uh, in this script, it does have support, like the doc string says, for IPv6 and the HTTP connect method, both of which are, um, a, you know, a little extra that you might not find in every other proxy. So that's why we specifically call them out in the doc string. Otherwise, if you see a file named proxy.py and it's an HTTP proxy, you're pretty confident you know what it does and what it can do. Okay, so let's go down to the next error. Um, these ones are, th there will be a lot of these expected two blank lines found on, so um, I, I think it's uh, pylint that is uh, throwing these errors. Um, so basically, any top-level class or function, it expects two blank lines before. Any function or class that is not at the global scope, uh, just one space is fine. So, for example, a method within a class just gets one space. A class itself at the top-level scope gets two. So when I fix something, I just immediately save it to make sure that the error goes away. And in that case, it did. Um, so going to the next error, we can see that there is no white space around the double equals. Um, you know, and this is a, a consistency and a readability thing. It's, uh, you know, if the entire community had agreed that we weren't going to put white space around a double equals, it would be fine to not do that. But since the convention is to have spaces, doing it the other way without spaces, it, it just introduces cognitive dissonance for the reader when they're reading your code. You know, they it just kind of jumps out at you when you've after you've read a lot of code. So uh, to make it easier on the reader, and really that's most of what we're doing is to make it easier on the reader, uh, we'll, we'll use the convention of spaces around these operators. Now this line has complains about space around the modulo operator. So one thing to keep in mind while we're doing this is we don't really want to just kind of robotically fix these uh, issues doing the least amount of work possible. We need to think about, you know, what is the best way to fix this? And it might not always be the most obvious way. The most obvious way to fix this is just to put the spaces around the modulo operator. Um, and it also complains about this comment not having two spaces, and it should have a space there. Okay, so now, th there we fixed it. But the bigger issue here is that it's using the modulo operator. Um, and Newer code, um, it, you know, it's explicitly stated <coughs> in the Python document, the official Python documentation, that string.format should be preferred over the modulo operator for string formatting. So the, the proper way to fix this would be to just change this uh, to, oops, to this. Uh, and we'll get rid of the debug because, uh, you know, when you're printing something out, it's it's clear that, uh, I mean, the debug doesn't add any value to saying that a print is debug versus regular. I mean, there, there's no difference. So we'll just erase that. Um, <clears throat> okay, continuing down the page, we see uh, another set of missing white space around operators. And we will fix them. This has uh, a trailing white space at the at the end of the line, so you can see 
that my cursor can go all the way to here, even though the last character is here. So I'll just delete all that. Uh, same thing here. This goes uh, quite a ways. So in Vim, I'm just hitting uh, D dollar sign, and that'll delete to the end of the line. Uh, here, another space around the operator. And also the line is too long. And uh, furthermore, it's using the modulo operator again, as did the previous one. So while we're here, let's just change these to both use the format string syntax. And uh, in addition, I, I think for this one specifically, the format string syntax is going to be a lot more clear uh, um, than using the modulo operator because it's both using the modulo operator and um, string concatenation with the, the plus operator. So let's just change this wholesale to be, uh, and we'll, we'll use the string format that takes uh, named parameters. So uh, we'll just say HTTP ver connection established. Uh, we don't need this plus because we're inside uh, parentheses. The string continuation is assumed. Um, so then proxy agent, and we'll call this version. So this refers to a global variable called version defined at the top, um, which may not be a great name for it, considering it's being used as the string for the proxy agent header, but that's fine for now. So then we just change this to .format HTTP ver equals that global variable and version equals version. Okay, and let's put this on the next line. Okay, so we, we fixed that aside from the missing double uh, ending parenthesis. So you can see that this reads a little more naturally now because uh, you don't have all the, the plus and percent s. What you have is placeholders that have names that specify exactly what's going to go there. Um, so uh, to me, this reads a lot more clearly than what was there, which is this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that it, it's become so clear to everyone that the format, the dot format uh, style of stream formatting is clear, more clear in almost every situation that y you should feel free to use it in, in every situation where you would otherwise use the modulo operator. Here's, a, here's another great example. Um, in this send function, we have three strings that are being sent. Now, looking at this, the, the string itself, we have no idea what's actually being sent. We have to go here into the, the format string and look to see what's being sent and then go back and see where each one is going to go. Um, again, with um, string.format, and especially with the name parameters, we can make this a lot more readable. So we'll change this to method path and protocol um, and then we'll set the appropriate values here Um, and then it appends uh, the client buffer here, right? So what we can actually do is just add that here. And get rid of the string concatenation. And add it as just another format parameter. So once we add the closing parentheses, um, we've clean that up uh, a good deal. Oh, I need buffer equals. 
Oh, yeah, buffers are reserved for it. So let's call it client buffer, which was its original name. Okay. <clears throat> so you can see now this reads quite a bit more clearly than just the percent %s's uh, not knowing exactly what they stood for. And in, in addition, it's clear that after we send the method path and protocol, we have a new line and then we send the client buffer. In the previous version of the code, we it, it was difficult to see that the client buffer was actually being appended at the end. Here it's very clear. Okay. <clears throat> Continuing down, um, we have another operator spacing issue. Um, and then this is the end of the file, so it's 110 lines long. Um, let's look at the errors here. So we need an extra blank line. Uh, so this is an interesting error. The continuation line over indented for visual indent means that um, the indentation is off based on what type of continuation line you're trying to use. So there are really two types of continuation lines. Um, there's the visual one, which lines up everything under the first parameter. So um, this would fix the error just removing that space so that host and handler both line up. And in fact, if we wanted to add even another column, we could do that here, remove the white space. Um, and this is called a visual continuation. Um, now there's another type of continuation though, where before even listing, there, there's a new line before you even list the first argument. Um, and in this case, you know, we could do something like this if it all fit on one line. It's definitely not going to because here's column 80. So the line is too long. Um, and in that case, if it doesn't all fit on one line, um, you know, you could break it up like this or, or, or something to that effect. But what I find to be the best is everything on its own line. Uh, and I'll explain why in a second. So now we have start server um, with all the parameters on its own line. Um, normally, I, so I, I'll actually go back and change this to the visual indent because that's what I use for um, functions. But for everything else where you have multiple parameters um, on that can't fit on one line, I like to use this style of continuation where you have one argument per line. So um, for functions, it's a little different because people expect and, and grep expects that the parameters to a function are going to be on the same line as the, the death. So here at least we'll put as many parameters as we can. And I think that's going to be the that's going to be it um, and just use the visual continuation in other places and especially with lists uh, or tuples where you're creating uh, a list of let's say constant values you which you may want to add to so for example if we had a list of the methods we supported we might say methods equals um, get, put, post, delete. Um, so now, what happens if I want to remove post, add patch, and add head? Um, well, you know, I have to go and do this, and then add head and patch. Um, and that's fine, but what's going to be difficult to do is see the difference between this and the previous version. Um, you're going to have, if you use like uh, git, git's built in diff, um, it's going to show you that one line changed, but there were essentially three logical changes in the line. You know, you added, um, you 
removed one uh, of the list elements and added two more. So in order to get the three logical changes shown in git, which represents exactly what was actually changed, if we have them all on their own line, because diff tools work on a line by line basis, this then will show us exactly what was changed um, by highlighting the line where there is a difference. So now we can do patch and head um, and the diff tools would say that this line changed and this line was added and, and it becomes very clear. Uh, it would be actually even more clear if we added patch to the end. So we'll see that um, put was deleted and head and patch were added in a diff tool. Um, so the idea is just to maximize the clarity and the ease of diffing files um, because you know to the to readers of the code this style is no less readable than this style um, so if they are equivalent to the reader then let's make things easier for people who are reading diffs and do it in a way that makes diffs easy to read. So anyway, back to <coughs> um, cleaning up the rest of this, fi this file. So th there's only a couple more errors. Um, here we have space around the operator. Um, and this, okay, so this is another one where you don't just do it without thinking. Uh, uh, you know, you got to uh, and, and I just flubbed on this. I should have realized that it's comparing to true, um, and, and we never do direct comparisons to true. We use Python's built-in truthiness um, notion to determine if something is compares to true or not. And so all we have to do is that if IPv6, um, if that was none or false, then this will be this will evaluate to false, anything else will evaluate to true. So that's the proper fix for that line. <clears throat> Here again, there's missing white space and same problem here. Um, here again, it's a print statement with using modulo and it has that debug there. Um, we'll fix this using string.format as usual. Another thing that you'll notice here is the use of double quotes. Um, I typically, well, first of all, it should be consistent. You see double quotes here, and then, for example, in the host parameter, it has a local host and single quotes. Um, certainly be consistent with either single quotes or double quotes. Uh, except in you know specific instances where you have to use one or the other, um, which are very rare. So I always use single quotes. I think that's the convention that most people follow. Um, but certainly, if you're going to use double quotes, use them everywhere. Um, so let's just change that and change this to string dot format, and we. We won't give these names. We'll just do that. Actually, let's use, to make this compatible with Python 2.6 if we wanted to, um, 2.6 doesn't support the um, ordered formatting where there is no index like this. Um, it only supports having explicit indexes or names. So this will uh, keep it consistent or keep it uh, compatible with Python 2.6, even though other parts of the code are not. It's just a, um, you know, something to be aware of, I guess. Okay, now we fixed the last problem, and you'll see all these, all these new ones popped up, and that's because a new tool now is reporting its problem. So we fixed all the uh, pilot pro or the PEP8 problems, and now we're running into the pilot problems. Uh, and these are usually more insidious than just, uh, you know, 
weird formatting. Uh, so the first thing we see is that this is an old style class. Old style classes are classes that don't inherit from object. Um, and basically, if you have the choice, if you're writing new code, you should always use new style classes in Python 2. In Python 3, everything is a new style class by default, but you create a new style class in Python 2 by inheriting from object. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, it's a bit out of scope for the video. It has to do with uh, method resolution order, among other things. Um, but suffice it to say that new style classes are preferred to old style classes. So if you have the opportunity, um, use new style classes where possible. So this do also doesn't have a doc string. So when I just saved it, that error didn't go away on that line because it's missing a doc string. So um, I'm going to have to add a doc string for this class. And let's just look at the code real quickly to get a sense of what that actually does. Um, you see there's one f global function called start server. Uh, that's called immediately from uh, if name equals main. Uh, and it takes as a parameter the um, connection handler class. So the class that will handle connections um, when a new thread is spawned to serve these connections. So you can see down here, this is all just creating a socket. And then uh, it says while one start new thread. Um, this this is also using the um, the older well not necessarily older but the lower level thread package rather than threading um, which is fine but it's a little less clear just by reading it what it's actually doing um, but it's saying that calling connection handler connection handler is what's going to be uh, called and the parameters to it are what you get back from calling socket.accept plus adding a timeout. So it's quite obtuse and, and very difficult to determine just by reading it what's actually being sent into this thread, hand, this thread call and kind of what these, um, what this all evaluates to. Uh, but we'll fix that later. We just want to kind of get a sense for what this is all doing in general. Um, so it's clear then that the connection handler class is responsible for um, performing the actual proxying between the client and the server. Um, it has methods to get header information, uh, deal with method, HTTP methods in the appropriate manner, uh, and then read and write to the client and the, the target server. So uh, uh, let's think of an appropriate doc string for the class. And I think that's a, a fine doc string. OK, now that error goes away. Um, and, and this is interesting. So in the init uh, method, the one of the arguments is, is not being used anywhere. So you see address here. If I search for it by um, hitting the asterisk in Vim, I can see that address is not used anywhere in the init function. So um, that's another thing that you know we want to fix. But right now, um, it's not entirely clear how we would do that because uh, the way that these parameters are being sent, these arguments are being sent in, is using this socket.accept return value um, and adding timeout to it. So what we'll have to do is kind of change this uh, uh, construct down here so that we don't have to send in something that we don't actually need. Um, for now, what we can do is just replace it with an underscore, um, which is the 
um, universal way of signifying I don't care about the value that's here. Um, but this is wholly unsatisfying, so we'll definitely come back to this later and fix that. Okay, um, again, we're, we're getting a missing doc string error, and if we look down, we're going to get one for every single function because none of them have doc strings. So um, it's a good exercise, though, to make sure that we understand what each function is doing to write the doc string for it. So if we look at get base header, we see that it's called in from the init, and it returns the HTTP method, the path, and the protocol. Um, so we can simply say return a tuple of method, path, protocol from the receive message. Okay, so client sends a message this extracts out the method, path, and protocol and returns it as a tuple. Um, and that fixes the missing doc string error there. So as to the actual implementation, we'll go through that uh, once we finish writing the doc strings because there are um, some things that we could do to clean this up a bit. Okay, method connect. Um, so this uh, handle HTTP connect messages message. And that's really all it does, and, and it doesn't return anything. Um, so I think just writing, you know, handles connect messages is, is fine because if it returns something, we would say that, but it doesn't. So um, we'll just describe briefly what it does. Now, there's still an error here because it's saying that method connect in all caps is an invalid name. Um, I, I tend to agree that mixing, uh, having all caps in a function name um, kind of confuses things because of uh, the convention that all caps means global variable. So looking at this function definition, I would be confused as to why connect was all caps and may think that it had something to do with the use of a global variable somewhere. So we could just rename this method connect. Um, and that doesn't make it any less clear how to use it, in my opinion. OK, and that'll fix that error. Method others, missing a doc string. Uh, handle all non HTTP connect messages. And that's exactly what this does. And again, it doesn't return anything. Otherwise, we would have described that in the doc string. Connect target. So if we look here, um, what we're doing is parsing out the host and port information um, that we need to be able to create a socket connection to the target web server. Um, so let's write that in the doc string. Uh, and I write doc strings in a format that is amenable to using Sphinx and, and um, restructured text. So when I refer to a parameter, um, I use the I surround it by the asterisks just so it'll be um, clear in the documentation that that word is special. Okay. Um, if we save that, now we have an error here. Okay, the, the problem is that self.target is actually never defined in the init method and is first referenced in this member function connect target. Um, the reason that this is an issue is because 
when you are dealing with objects um, and object-oriented programming in general, you always assume that once uh, an object is constructed, that it's fully constructed and it's in a um, reasonable state. So it, the, its state is consistent. Um, that means that I should be able to call any method on it and not worry that, you know, I didn't do some other setup function that needed to be done. Now, in this case, um, you know, it, it it's not used... Um, the way that this is used, it's not really an issue because clients aren't going to be calling these functions directly. Um, but it's still better to have self.target in init, um, especially because self.target is, is referenced in init. Um, so we can just up here say self.target equals none. And if we go back and look, we can see that that error went away. Okay, so let's quickly write the two remaining doc strings. Uh, so the last member function is called read-write. And this just reads data from the client. And forwards it to the server connection. That's all it does. And this line is too long. It didn't get all wrapped. Okay, and start server. This is, uh, it's pretty obvious what this does. Start the HTTP proxy server. Okay. Um, now, upon saving this, oh, IPv6, it's saying is an invalid name. Um, again, I tend to agree with this. I would s say this, um, even though IPv6 is, is normally written like the way it, it was previously, um, you know, it's, it's better to follow the conventions of Python rather than um, just... Uh, I would say it's better to follow Python conventions rather than um, conventions outside of Python. So in Python, the, you know, the convention is separate words by underscores um, and all lowercase for variable names. So we could do this or we could do this. Um, I tend to think the this is more readable, but you know, the, this is more a matter of preference than um, what is actually correct or not. But you know what is clear is we should be using all lowercase names unless we have a really good reason not to okay so now that i save it we see all the errors are gone um and the f file looks good in the sense that we've cleaned it up um, we haven't changed any of the implementation uh but you know it it's uh, quite a bit more readable uh, and conforms to a lot of the PEP8 conventions. So one of the things that you need to be aware of when you're doing these kinds of refactorings is that y making breaking changes. So w in what we did, we didn't intentionally make any changes that would break the functionality of the server. Um, now, we don't have unit tests for this, so it's kind of difficult to ensure that that is still true um, but what we can do is just run it um, and just running the proxy means it, it still should work as, as a normal HTTP proxy so um, I'm gonna run this uh, okay so now we see um, oh tuple index out of range so I made a, a very simple and um, silly error um, down here. It should have been like that. Okay, now serving on localhost 8080, so at least it starts. Um, how do we actually test if it proxies stuff correctly though? Well, we're going to have to do a bit of setup, so I just hit control C and, and stop the server. Um, we need 
two screens open, two terminal sessions open rather, so I have a second one here. Um, and this is the one that we're going to actually use to send an HTTP request. So in Unix and, I'm sorry, in Linux and on Macs, um, there is an environment variable called HTTP underscore proxy and also HTTPS underscore proxy that controls uh, the value whether or not a, a, a proxy is actually used. And most, if not all, major um, HTTP programs and libraries honor that. So even something like, if you set this in the shell, even something like Chrome or Firefox will, will honor that. So um, the way to set that is by saying export HTTP Oops, proxy equals, and now we give the host and port, and this is just running on localhost 8080. Um, so now, if I try to go to google.com when the proxy is down, it's not going to work because it can't connect. Um, but if I start the proxy, which defaults to localhost 8080, and then go back and try again, I can see I get the response that I expect from google.com. So that HTTP proxy environment variable is important when using the script. That has to be set or else um, your curl or HTTPy program won't know that it's supposed to use a proxy. Um, in browsers, you know, we can use this in a browser um, but there are also usually like uh, ways to set it directly in the browser as opposed to setting the environment variable. Um, <clears throat> okay, so it looks like all the changes we made didn't break anything, and that's good, obviously. So l we can now go back um, and continue editing. If I were saving this in Git, if I were you know keeping this under version control. And now is certainly a time to commit it. I, I probably would have done so earlier, um, but we've reached kind of a natural stopping point, and now is a, a good time to commit the file. Um, if we look at, um, so this is the Git repository for all of my Kickstarter videos. Um, what I will do is create a repository just for um, this second video that we're working on. So git init, git add, okay. So there, I've, I've committed both of them. Um, it would have been nice to have committed the proxy file in its original form, um, but since we have proxy or ridge, it's really not necessary. I could fake that by going back and um, renaming it and you know move the file out of the way, but I think for this, it's, it's really not um, entirely necessary uh, because we do have the original one that we can just do diff proxy.py, proxy origin.py, and we can see exactly what changed. Um, so I will put this on GitHub, and in the comment uh, for the video on YouTube, I will give you the um, Git repository location. Uh, so feel free to download this and follow along. Um, but let's go back to the code. So We've gotten it all formatted like we want, but let's see how it actually works and if there are things that we could do to make it more clear, make it work better, um, make it more maintainable, more understandable. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing we see is there are these three um, global variables one for bufflen, and if we look at the use by, I'm hitting again, uh, asterisk in vim, 
Um, we can see that's used as the argument to a call to socket.receive. So that specifies the maximum number of bytes to receive. Um, let's see if it's used anywhere else. Yes, it's also used in a receive call in the read write function. Um, so that, that something like this is fine, but um, I would follow the convention to not use abbreviations or acronyms unless it's widely understood what they are. So for example, I wouldn't write out HTTP as hypertext transfer protocol. I would just write HTTP, but for something like a buffer length, um, there's really no reason to call it bufflen instead. It's much less clear the name bufflen, um, but just by adding a couple more characters, now it's explicit what this variable represents. And, you know, we're not saving, uh, you know, we're not being charged by the byte anywhere. So adding a couple of um, characters to the name of a variable is, is really not uh, a terribly um, involved change or, or something to be concerned about. Uh, you know, I would definitely err on the side of providing too much information rather than providing uh, too little, and, and that's what this is doing. Uh, it just makes it that much more readable. Uh, in addition, HTTP ver here, I mean, saving three letters, really not helping anyone. So um, we'll just call this HTTP version. Um, and actually, oops, what I'll do is find where it's used first, and then make that change. Uh, <clears throat> Oops. Uh. Okay, I'm also going to change the use in the format string for the same reason. Um, you know, it's just that much more clear what it's actually doing. Uh. Okay, and let's see if there's any... Nope, those were the only places it was being used. Okay, jump back up to the top, uh, and then we have this version string. That looks fine, except um, for string concatenation, I would still use um, dot .format, even though, uh, you know, this seems rather simple. I would still do this. Um, you know, it's just a matter of consistency and not making the reader have to switch between uh, using plus for concatenation and using format string. So, you know, that's just another consistency thing. All right, let's take a look at the init method. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, variables being set. So connection, timeout, uh, client buffer, so client buffer is going to be used to receive data from the client. Uh, Self.client is the actual socket connection to the client. Timeout is going to be a, a read or write timeout on the socket. Uh, Self.target, if you remember, we added that, um, and that is going to represent the socket connection to the target web server. Um, method, path, and protocol are all um, of the incoming um, message. Um, and then here we're just closing connections. So one thing that jumps out at me is self.method, path, and protocol um, are used only within, it looks like, only within um, this connection handler. So let's just look around for where self.method is used. Okay, it's used in method others, and that's it. So what we could do instead of making these, um, and we'll do the same for path and protocol too. So path is used in method connect and method others. Um, 
which makes sense, and I'm assuming protocol is going to be the same. Method others, yep. Okay, so uh, this is kind of a um, subtle point, but um, one of the things that you want to avoid is using um, class attributes as kind of a way of avoiding using parameters to functions because it makes it much more difficult to test the the function in quit the member function in question so uh, let's give an example um, if I wanted to test method connect the only parameter to the function the only argument to the function is the object itself so I a call to method connect would be something like this right so in a testing scenario just calling this is not going to be sufficient because I need to have the um, uh, the path here available so that it can actually connect to the opposite um, you know connect to the server that it, it it's meant to in the self.client. Um, so it makes it much more difficult to test. What would make it easier if I, is if I just had the path as a extra parameter and called it and used it directly. So how could we change this? Well, we could change this by, um, instead of calling self.path, just use path like that. And we'll also have to change method others to take a path. But again, it's making it much easier to test this because now we have a way without having to manipulate the object itself of passing in the parameters that change the behavior of the object. Right, so you can imagine if I get rid of self.protocol and self.method as well, then I can test these functions in isolation. I can test these member functions without having to um, set up different parts of the object. Um, and you know, it possibly it, it may be non-trivial to do that. So using them as just normal arguments makes a lot more sense. Um, they're not really state that needs to be kept around. Um, they are just pieces of information that are going to be used once and, and or used a couple times but in a sequential manner and then just discarded. So it doesn't make sense to keep them as attributes on the object. Uh, it, it makes more sense just to treat them as normal variables, use them, and then be done with them. So let's make the change to be able to do that. So we'll add method path protocol. Actually, does method connect use all of them? Um, no, it only uses path. Okay, what uses method? Uh, method others. So we'll put method here and protocol here. And you know, like we see, nothing else uses method. So literally the only time that method is used is checking which type of method it is to figure out which type of function to call. And in method others, um, to be able to actually write out the method in the HTTP request. Um, so doing this shouldn't break anything. Um, uh, now we're getting a continuation line uh, error. But anyway, um, so you can see now we changed it from from those being attributes of the object to those just being regular variables. and really nothing has changed in terms of the um, 
behavior of the server. It's just that we performed a refactoring, which you know doesn't change the operation. It just changes uh, the structure. Uh, so now method connect and method others, they take um, uh, arguments that they didn't take before, but it's not problematic because the, the values are going to be exactly the same. Um, and to prove that to ourselves, the easiest thing to do is, of course, to test it. So we already have the um, HTTP underscore proxy set. Let's confirm that. Um, and the way that we do that is by typing echo and then the name of the variable. Um, and we can see that it is still set. So I should be able to run proxy.py. Oh, sorry. I, I run it in the other one. Python proxy.py. Okay, it's running. And now get google.com. And lo and behold, it, it still works. Um, so now is another good time to um, commit and git. And we're at a point where everything still works, um, but we've made some architectural changes, we'll call them. Um, so if we go back to init, let's finish off the refactoring this function. Um, we see that there's an if and an elif, um, but there's no else or anything that happens if the HTTP method is not one of the eight or so that are listed here. So there's two things that we can do. Um, we can just ignore it like as is currently done, but ignore it in a more succinct and clear way, or we can add error handling. So let's go through how both of them would look. Um, the key thing to realize here is that if the method is connect, then this is the member function that's called. If it's anything else, then method others is called. So rather than checking if it's in here, we can just say else call that. Because we don't actually look at the method to see which ones we support. We're, we're just, uh, if it's not there, then nothing is going to happen. So, um, you know, this is something where we can make things a little bit clearer by having just the else. Now, I mean, the, there was kind of, if, if you were looking very closely at this, you might have noticed that there, there is kind of a built-in error handling. And I'll go back to the previous version of the code. Um, and that is, if the method were not in one of these ones that we support, then what would happen, right? There's no else, you know, uh, raise an error or something like that here. All, there, all that would happen is it, it would continue and close the sockets. So uh, that's, uh, you could kind of say that that is built-in error handling. Um, I would argue that point because self.target doesn't even exist at this point. So it, it doesn't have a close method and that would throw, um, that would raise an exception. Um, same for self.client, um, but you know, the, you could kind of say that the author uh, you may have thought that he was adding in some subtle error handling here, but let's just make it explicit. Um, if we look at method others, um, we see that it, it doesn't even actually use the, it doesn't do anything different based on which method was sent in. So just having the else here, um, Oops. Just having the else here is, is fine because 
it's we never do any type of different logic based on which method was actually sent in. Um, it's only connect that's special. Uh, and then finally we have um, the client.close and target.close. Um, it's kind of a rather odd place for them in the init method. Um, and I would probably remove them from here because it has nothing to do with the actual initialization of the object. Um, what it's almost saying is that when you get the object back from the call to the constructor, so if I say um, handler equals connection handler, um, you know, with the arguments, what it's almost saying is by the time that you get this connection handler object returned to you and, and handler uh, is set to a value, the object is useless. Um, so it's, it's kind of a rather odd way to do it, to have this in the init statement. It, it may be the case that that is um, that design is appropriate, and in this case, I think it is. We just want to close the connection. We want to handle one connection at a time and then close them. But having it in the init method uh, is a little bit confusing, especially because client and target aren't um, referenced. At the, uh, I mean, target especially doesn't have a value necessarily at this point that is obvious when you're just reading the init. So I would take these out and move them um, to um, the read-write function, probably. Um, because it, if we look at method connect and method others, we see that in the last line, all roads lead to self dot underscore read-write. So what we could do is just at the end of this, oops, at the end of this, add those uh, where we know that self.client and self.target definitely exist. Um, so if we make that change, um, let's see if everything still works. So here I'll run the proxy. And here I'll make the request. Yes, everything does still work. And let's just try another request. Yes, that works as well. Okay, so we didn't break anything. And in my mind, this init method is much more clear than um, the one that existed previously. So I noticed we've just passed the hour mark, um, and I want to keep these videos reasonably short, um, but I don't want to break them up so that, you know, there's not really that much being done in each video. So this seems like a natural stopping point. Uh, we'll continue and finish this in video three, um, which will be coming soon. Um, and for now, you can take a look at the Git repository, check out the code, um, and see all the changes that were made. Uh, in addition, if you do so, you'll probably see what was done um, or what will be done in the third video uh, because those will all be in the same repository. Um, or maybe I'll make a, a separate repository, who knows. Um, but anyway, so I hope you enjoyed uh, the video. I hope you found it somewhat informative. I realize we focused a lot on format and convention and, and not so much on implementation, um, but that's important. You know, what, part of the message of the book is that following the conventions that the community has adopted is important. And the reason is it makes your code easier to read for you, for others, it's easier to maintain, and it's definitely easier to test. Um, so in video three, we will finish refactoring this um, and really focus on the implementation and how we can clean that up as much as possible. So thanks for joining me, and until next time, take care.